أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سورة أنزلناها وفردناها وأنزلنا وأنزلنا فيها بينات لعلكم تذكرون الزانية والزاني فاجلدوا كل واحد منهما مئة جلدة ولا تأخذكم بما رأفة في دين الله إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر وليشهد عذابهما طائفة من المؤمنين الزاني لا ينكح إلا زانية أو مشركة والزانية لا ينكحها إلا زان أو مشرك وحرم ذلك على المؤمنين والذين يرمون المحصنات ثم لم يأتوا ثم لم يأتوا بأربعة شهداء فاجلدوهم فاجلدوهم ثمانين جلة ولا تقبلوا لهم شهادة أبدا أولئك هم الفاسقون إلا الذين تابوا من بعد ذلك وأصلحوا فإن الله غفور رحيم والذين يرمون أزواجهم ولم يكن لهم شهداء إلا فشهادة أحدهم أربع شهادات بالله إنه لمن الصادقين والخامسة أن لعنة الله عليه كان من الكاذبين ويدرأ عنها العذاب تشهد أربع شهادات بالله إنه لمن الكاذبين والخامسة أن غضب الله عليها كان من الصادقين ولولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته وأن الله تواب حكيم صلح الله العظيم Today inshallah we will be doing the tafsir of Surah Al-Mu'minun which is the 23rd chapter of the Quran it's a Makkan surah and it has 118 verses and inshallah if we have time we will be doing Surah Al-Nur as well which is the 24th chapter of the Quran, it has 64 verses, and it was revealed in Medina. Um, before I get started, I would just like to make a request. I have made uh, two, three of you as co-host, since we don't have our usual co-host today. So inshallah, if they can help me, you know, admit everyone into the, uh, into the session, inshallah. <clears throat> So let us begin with Surah Al-Mu'minun first. Surah Al-Mu'minun, it's a Makkan Surah, and it covers the typical themes that are covered in the Makkan Surah, which are Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, Risalat, prophethood, and Akhirah, the hereafter, the day of judgment. There are actually three surahs in the Quran that are named after three categories of people of mankind. You have the believers, you have a surah named after them, Al-Mu'minun. Then you have the disbelievers, and we have a surah named after them, Al-Kafirun. Then you have the hypocrites, the munafiqun, and we have a surah named after them as well. And then within each broad category, we can have two subcategories as well. So for example, amongst the believers, you have the average person, the average believer. And then you have the ones who are the best of the best, the elite. And both of these groups are referenced in Surah Waqi'ah. Ashabu al-Yameen, the people of the right hand, and as sabiqun as sabiqun When it comes to the disbelievers, they are also in two categories. You have those who completely reject, knowingly. And then you have those who are ignorant of the truth. They are referenced in Surah Fatiha. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ and then even the hypocrites are of two types. And they were explained in the parables that we covered in Surah Al-Baqarah. Those who are complete hypocrites, they don't even have an atom weight of Iman in their heart. Right? And then we have the other category of hypocrites. They have some khair, they have some good in their heart, but they waver between truth and falsehood. 
ومن الناس من يعبد الله على حد. They worship Allah on the verge. If they see some good in Islam, they will come to this side. If they face some difficulty, then they start criticizing. So they are also referenced in Surah Al-Baqarah as well. Here we're going to be covering Surah Al-Mu'minun. It begins with the seven characteristics of the believers. So let us try to cover that, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah by saying, Qad aflaha al-mu'minun. Indeed, successful are the believers. Who are the believers? Alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'un. They are those who have khushu in their salah. They don't just simply pray their salah. They have concentration, focus in their salah. Now the question that many of us ask is, how do we develop khushu in our salah? Because it seems for many of us, as soon as we say Allahu Akbar, between the takbir and the taslim, we think of everything except for the salah. All of these thoughts, they start coming to our mind. So how do we develop khushu in our salah? I'm sure all of you may have heard the story. And this is a universal story or joke about the person who was praying salah behind the imam and the imam happened to make a mistake. Instead of praying four rakahs, he prayed three rakahs. So after the salah, of course, there was some commotion. There was some discussion about the number of rakahs that the imam had performed. There was this one person who was very adamant that the imam had prayed three and not four. So they asked him, they said, how can you be so certain? And so the answer he gave was that I have four stores. I'm a businessman, I'm a merchant, and I do the hisab calculation of each one of my store in each rak'ah. I'm always able to complete the calculation of all of the four stores. Today, however, I only completed the calculation of three stores. I have one more to go. So of course, this is not how we should be praying our salah. Now let's ask ourselves the question, when was the last time we prayed an entire salah being completely devoted, having full concentration and khushu in our salah? Forget about all of the four rak'ahs, even one rak'ah, where we're fully focused in the salah. Now the question is, how do we develop khushu in our salah? One of the best and one of the most effective way, in my opinion, is by understanding the meaning of what we recite in our salah. At least the bare minimum is Fatiha and the few short surahs that we know. What does Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen mean? What does Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim mean? And I actually have a series on Surah Al-Fatiha and I think they are posted to YouTube. Uh, this is back when I used to record my lectures. So perhaps someone is interested, they can um, go through that series. Or I'm sure there may be some other series as well on YouTube. You can listen to these lectures on the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, They have these courses out there now. It is called Meaningful Prayer. They teach you the meaning of each word, each phrase that we recite in our salah. So, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are the believers. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ قَاشِعُونَ They are those who have khushu in their salah. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ وَمُعْلِدُونَ they are those who are who refrain from vain talks, from vain things. They don't gossip, they don't backbite, they don't slander others. Unfortunately, many times when we sit together at the dinner table, as we're eating food, we're also eating the flesh of our Muslim brothers as well. So this is something we need to refrain from because this is a major sin in Islam. Allah has compared backbiting to eating the flesh of your Muslim brother. The third one, They are those who give their zakat. Realize zakat is an obligation in Islam. It is one of the pillars of Islam that is almost always mentioned alongside salah. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, salah, establish the salah, almost always it is followed up with the phrase, وَآتُ zakat, give zakat. If everyone on this earth gave their just 2.5% of their wealth, poverty will be eliminated from the face of this earth. Okay, Many times we think, especially living in the West, that I may be a recipient of zakat. Actually, it may be the reverse. You might actually be obligated to give zakat. You don't need to be a millionaire. You don't need to have $100,000 in your account to give zakat. 
if you reach the nisab of silver, you give 2.5%. And we spoke about the nisab of silver, it's about 612 grams. If you convert that into dollars, it's literally approximately say $400, give and take. So you just give only 2.5% of that. It may not be much to you, but your 2.5% is actually 100% for someone else. It might save a person, starving family for maybe a few days, maybe a week or so. The average person only makes $2.50 a day, right? And an entire month, whatever they make is less than what person here in the West makes in one day when getting minimum wage in one day. What he gets in one day is what another person who has a good salary would make in an entire uh, month. They say that over a billion people, they don't have food three times a day. Over a billion people don't have access to clean water. So this little bit of money that we give, $10, $20, $100, Allah has blessed you with more, you give more zakah. If you have $10,000, you give whatever 2.5% is, $250, it is going to, of course, you know, help a lot of families. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, the next uh, description, or the next characteristic of the believer is they protect their chastity. Number five and six, they protect their trust and they fulfill their promises. Right? This is something we need to also focus on as well. Alhamdulillah, some of us might be doing good in ibadat in acts of worship, we might be fasting, praying salah. When it comes to ma'amalat, dealing, dealings with others, it seems like we are zero, right? So this is something we need to keep in mind. We make a promise, we must fulfill it. If someone entrusts us with something, we must make sure we don't breach that trust. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then concludes this section by saying, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ سَنَوَاتِ they are those who preserve their salah. So it begins with salah and it ends with salah. Such are the inheritors. Who will inherit firdaus, paradise. By the way, the word firdaus and paradise has the same linguistic origin. Paradise, firdaus. Verse number 12 to 16 talks about the creation of man. We spoke about this yesterday. Verse number 17 to 22, the blessings of Allah. Allah sends down water in a specific quantity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions the fact that he causes vegetation, the gardens of date palms and grapes to grow forth with this water. Uh, all of these blessings are mentioned. Karo, wa alayha wa alayha uh, ships and so on and so forth. Verse number 23 to 30 speaks about the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. In verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Thumma ansha'na min ba'dihim qarnan akhareen. That we then brought another generation right, into existence after them. Um, verse number 42 to 44. I find this to be very interesting and I want to speak on this a little bit. Then we brought forth many generations after them. And in the notes I have over here, that it seems, this seems to suggest that the earth is older than 6,000 years, right? Why do I want to mention this? Because other faith communities, they believe, it's part of their belief system, their aqidah, that the earth is 6,000 years old. That mankind has been on earth for only 6,000 years. So this has allowed scientists and you know, the scientific community and the atheists to mock and make fun of the religious community. So sometimes Muslim, right, they said, how could this be? You have all this archeological evidence and scientific evidence to prove that we, are, we have been on earth for much longer than that. So Muslims, they try to defend this, but actually this is not our battle to fight. We don't need to defend this because we don't even have a timeline. The Quran doesn't tell us we were on earth for 6,000 years. This is not our belief. What is our belief? It's neutral. Whatever science tells us. 
And in fact, there are verses in the Quran that seems to suggest that we've been here on earth for much longer than that. How much? It's vague. Okay? You don't have to believe in a specific timeline. For example, here it says we brought many, many generations after them. How many is many generations? Right? I mean, three is the minimum. But when he uses the word many, you could assume maybe 10, 15, 20, right? From the time of Adam to Nuh, wasalam, in one narration, it mentions that there were 10 generations. And it's possible those generations, they live longer than us. This generation lives for, say, you know, 60 to 70 years, maybe 100 years maximum. Nuh, wasalam, he preached for 950 years. So if you already have 10 generations already between Adam and Nuh, then who knows how many generations after Nuh And then there's a hadith that seems to suggest that we have been here for much longer than 6,000 years. In the hadith where it mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted from the back of Adam all of his progeny. And then there was a, a light that was shining brighter than the rest of the light. So Adam alayhi salatu wasalam asked, who is he? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is from your descendant, uh, uh, Dawood, who would come towards the end of times. And we know that Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam came, you know, a few thousand years ago. So if he's coming towards the end of times, and him being 2,000 years, is just towards the end of times, that means that Adam alayhi salatu wasalam must have been here much longer. Also, there is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that I and the hour have been sent like this, right? You look at the index finger and the middle finger. The index finger it is ahead of the index finger by just a little bit, right? So this shows that, and how long has it been since the Prophet ﷺ? 1400 years. And Qiyam has not come. Who knows when he will come? After 500 years, after 1000 years, 2000 years. So from the time of the Prophet until Qiyamah, if this is three, four, five thousand years, then from here to here, you multiply that by four, five, six times, it could be 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 years. So anyways, my point of mentioning this is, there's no timeline. You don't have to believe the 6,000 uh, years timeline. That is not our Aqidah. We're just neutral. It's something pertaining to the science of this world. Whatever they tell us, whatever archaeological evidence they have, we can go with that. Uh, verse number 45 to 49 is the story of Musa and Harun. Verse number 50 mentions the story of Isa salam, and his mother. Verse number 51 tells us the importance of eating halal. Oh messengers, eat of what is pure and do righteous deeds. So righteous deeds are mentioned after eating halal. So if you eat what is halal, then you'll be inclined to do what is permissible. If you eat haram, it will have an effect on your spirituality, especially your dua, right? Whatever dua you make will be affected through the food that you consume. Uh, verse number 52 uh, teaches us the importance of unity. That this is the ummah, you're one ummah, okay? So we should be together. You should be united as Muslim brothers and sisters. Despite our differences, we can still be united. There are different, I like to tell people, circles of cooperation, right? So those who are upon the sunnah 100%, you have a lot more in common with them. Those who may not be as practicing, but they're still part of the ummah, the Prophet wasallam, right? So there's different levels of unity by the way. And this is a much deeper topic. This is not the time to go into it. Uh, verse number 53 to 56. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that wealth and children is not a sign of their acceptance. The Quraysh used to think that because we've been blessed with children and wealth, that this is a sign that Allah is pleased with us. No. This is just one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests mankind. 51, 57 to 66. One, these verses talk about the true believers. That they're the ones who, when they do good deeds, they're still fearful, right? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she asked the messenger of Allah, like, you know, are these the hypocrites? They're fearful after doing good deeds. 
Prophet said, no, these are the believers that after doing a good deed, they are not confident and boastful that yes, now I have a free ticket to Jannah. Even after doing a good deed, they are not sure if it was done the way it is to be done properly. So they're always fearful and always doing istighfar. And that should be the state of the believer. That it should be between hope and fear. We don't have too much confidence. At the same time, don't become so um, fearful that you become depressed and you think you'll never make it to Jannah. It should be between hope and fear. Um, verse number 71, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ اِتَّبَعَ الْحَقَّ هُوَا أَمْ لَفَسَلَةِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِيهِمْ if truth had followed their desires, the heavens, the earth, and all those therein would have fallen in total disorder. Verse number 78 to 90, verses number 78 to 90, uh, mentions the proofs of resurrection. Okay. Verse number 91, the impossibility of the multiplicity of gods. It is impossible logically for there to be more than one all-powerful God. By definition, if someone is all-powerful, he cannot be submissive to someone else. How can you have three all-powerful gods or five? That means one has to listen to the other. So that theological argument is made there. Verse number 99 to 100 talks about barzakh. Okay, Barzakh is the time period from when you die until the trumpet is blown. And this is the only place in the Quran where the word barzakh is mentioned. Okay, Barzakh is mentioned by name. In other verses, it is referenced implicitly. And verse number 101 to 114, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the disbelievers on the Day of Judgment. The next surah, I wanted to start and inshallah, we'll try to conclude tomorrow. But uh, I, I do want to get started with the surah. It's a very long surah. There's a lot of laws that are mentioned because it is a uh, Madani surah. The Madani surahs, they usually discuss detailed laws of Islam. And this is kind of similar to Surah Al-Nisa, but still it is different in one way. Both surahs talk about, for example, women, but in Surah Al-Nisa, it talks about primarily the rights of women. Here, there are some certain laws which mentions the obligations upon women. Okay, So this is Surah Al-Nur, the 24th chapter of the Quran, it has 64 verses. The surah focuses on preserving the family unit, right? Verse number one to three, it mentions some harsh punishments, right? For the fornicators, right? Um, now, of course, as I was mentioning this morning, when people read these verses and the punishments that are mentioned, all of a sudden people start objecting to Islam and Sharia, and they start saying it is very harsh, very cruel. Actually, this is rahmah and mercy for mankind. The fact that you have strict and harsh rules, right, and punishments for the criminals. You know when the, um, you know, the serial killer and the rapist just going around doing whatever he wants. There needs to be harsh punishments for them, right? And by the way, these punishments, they exist in every legal system. You know, when people hear about the death penalty in Islam, well, it's not unique to Islam. Every single system a legal system or a system that is based on uh, some you know faith tradition values, they all have harsh punishments, right? Let me just give you an example. For example, the country we're living in here, right, in America, in 32 out of 50 states, they have the death penalty, right? And the death penalty has not always been just through, um, you know, the lethal injection. <laughs> there have been different ways of executing a person. We had the uh, execution by by hanging. You had execution by the firing squad. You had the gas chamber. You had the electric chair. You had all of these different ways of um, giving the death penalty, right? So, I mean, just imagine there's a person who has killed 20, 30, 40 people, and he is a serial killer. What should we do, right? Doesn't he deserve? And even in Islam, with the death penalty, you still have two other options. That if the family wants, they can either get blood money, or if they want, they can forgive as well. So even that option is there as well. Um, verse number four mentions the punishment that is to be given to a person who accuses an innocent, chaste woman. 
right? Because in this surah, the story of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is mentioned when she was accused, right? The slander was being circulated in Medina uh, of a crime, of a sin that is even difficult to say in the tongue, right? They had accused us of the worst, they accused Aisha, the Munafiqun, of the worst sin you can imagine. And then, of course, her innocence was revealed in the surah. But Allah mentions that those who accuse innocent chaste women and they don't bring the evidences, flog them 80 times. And it shows the honor and the respect that Islam gives to women. Okay. Um, then verse number six to ten talks about Li'an. If, for example, the husband if he suspects his wife and he sees that she has committed, you know, uh, zina, then what should happen if he cannot bring four witnesses? Then there is a method called Li'an where they go to court and in front of the judge um, they do Li'an. It's called mutual cursing where they send the la'na of Allah upon the one who is lying, right? Because if they don't confess and we don't have witnesses, what do we do? And they have to take an oath. And once both of them, they take these oaths, right? Then, of course, there can be separation between them. But this is, of course, something related to, you know, the Islamic state when there is a judge. We'll continue with the surah. There's a lot of details regarding uh, the surah. We'll continue with this tomorrow, inshallah. And we'll try to do surah to shu'ara as well. Now, I'll hand it over to uh, Mufti Bilal. I see that today we don't have that many people. I guess I did not send the the link. The reason I did not send the notes is because we're still doing the same two surahs. So I didn't want to send them again. But just every, for future, everyone should know that we have this session every day from 6.30 to about 7.10. Even if I don't send the reminder, everyone should know that it's the same time every day, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Okay, so inshallah we move on to the next parable. Um, and this is also in Surah Al-Hajj. So yesterday we discussed the first parable of Surah Al-Hajj. Now we move on to the second parable of Surah Al-Hajj. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here gives the parable of a person who is involved in shirk and in ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically a person who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the example of the one who commits shirk and ascribe partners to Allah is like the one who fell from the sky. الطير, and then a predatory bird, a bird that eats uh, other that eats meat and other animals such as a falcon or a vulture or some kind of bird in of this nature, it grabs him, it snatches him. <clears throat> Or he falls from the sky and then a strong wind dumps him, takes him, carries him and dumps him into a far off place. So over here, the sky, the Mufassirun explained, the sky is the is Tawheed, is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sky, in our understanding, the sky is a high place, is a place, you know, it's considered like a like a greater place because we're on the ground and anything higher is always considered better than that which is lower or generally. So <clears throat> the Tawheed is like that is the sky, right? That's Tawheed, that it's high, it's great, it's amazing. And then when a person is involved in shirk, he falls from that sky. He is not allowed to remain in that sky anymore, in that high place, in that high status. So he falls because of the shirk. Then the bird snatches him. So the bird over here is the desires of the nafs and the ego of a person. So the khahishat and the desires and the passion of the human, of the person, which he's not able to keep in control and in check. This is that bird that grabs him and snatches him and eats him up because it is these desires that caused him to fall into shirk and causes him to remain in shirk and in ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the bird. Or the wind takes him and dumps him in a far off place. Over here, the wind is likened to the whispers and the, um, 
influence of shaitan that when shaitan influences a person and pushes or invites a person towards disbelief in Allah and, and ascribing partners to Allah so this is like that strong wind that blows him away from the heavens above from the tawheed from the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dumps him in a far place meaning in the hole of shirk and him falling on the ground uh, when a person falls from such a high such a high place from such a height and falls in force then the person's obviously the bones and everything uh, breaks and crumbles so in this way when a person falls because of the shirk he has spiritually broken down so of course those who ascribe partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala physically apparently they're fine but there's this is their con this is their spiritual state that spiritually they're broken they're completely destroyed. As for the one who believes in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are like the ones in the skies, high above, in, in, a, in a high status and a position from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the um, first uh, uh, method and first parable. Now we go on to the second parable. At the end of the surah of Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this parable very quickly. Ya nas, Allah says, O oh people, a parable is being cited. So listen to it carefully. Inna lillatadi'una min dunillah. Over here as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a parable of shirk and disbelief. Specifically for those people who worship idols, right? The mushrikun, they used to believe in the idols. And even today we have many different uh, groups and religions that prostrate and bow down to idols and, and worship and venerate and respect and revere the idols. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is likening their, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to explain to these people how useless and how effectless and how helpless the idols are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example of their helplessness that listen, you have idols sometimes. Okay, so the first thing is the idols are so helpless that they can't even create a simple creature like a fly. In our understanding, compared to the human and the other bigger animals, a fly is so basic and it's so simple and it's so small and it's so ins insignificant. But Allah says the idols are so, which these people prostrate to and bow down to are so helpless that they can't even create a simple creation like the fly, okay? That is one, one, one aspect of the helplessness. But Allah says there's so, let alone that, put that aside, sometimes the mushrikun, the disbelievers in Makkah, what they would do is they would bring food and they would present food to the idols. They would cook food and prepare food and out of their ignorance, they would come and put the food and set it forth for the idols. That this is for the idols. Now, of course, the idol is a stone or wood or whatever it was made out of. It's not going to eat the food. So then the flies would come and would circle around that food and would consume that food which the mushrikun had put for the for their idols. So Allah says that the idols are so helpless that they can't even move away the flies when they come to take their food. If a fly comes in our food immediately, we know we swat it away, we move it away, right? But these idols are so helpless that they can't prevent the flies from coming and consuming their food and eating the food which the disbelievers have put for these idols. So Allah says this is the example of how helpless they are. So you can only imagine how helpless they are when it comes to providing for the for the humans. Because the humans, the mushrikun, they would prostrate to the idols thinking that the idol gives them rizq and the idol is giving them safety and the idol is giving them security, so on and so forth. So Allah says that if it is so helpless that it can't move the fly away, how can it help you? How can it sustain you? How can it give you safety, security, so on and so forth? Allah says this is the example of how helpless uh, these idols are uh, and these carved idols and how, how useless they are. So instead of prostrating to them, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will fulfill all of your needs. So these are the two parables for today. Inshallah, we will carry on from here. Jazakumullah uh, khairan wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And if you remember, we had also discussed that in this day, an interesting scientific miracle uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions the fly, not any other creature. So for those of you who remember, you know that there's something unique about the fly as compared to other, other creatures. Is it? the next dua we have is a continuation of the dua in Surah Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to mention the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. O oh my Lord, make me and those believers of my descendants keep a prayer, meaning establish prayer. O oh, our Lord, accept my prayer. So this is a continuation of the du'a of Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
And Hadar Ibrahim السلام, in this dua makes specifically dua for two things. Number one is the concept of establishment of salah. So Hadar Ibrahim السلام, he had the concern that, oh Allah, he himself should be establishing salah as well as his dhurriya, as well as his progeny. And if we were to look at this, uh, the chain of duas that we are discussing, the initial dua that Ibrahim السلام, he had made was regarding the people, Wadin غَيْرِ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ الْنَاسِ That one, Ibrahim السلام, he made dua for the residents of Makkah Mukarram. In other words, basically his family, his wife, his children who were there, and his progeny as well, upcoming progeny. And from amongst them, the first duas after his family, what did he make for? When it comes to the concept of ibadat, the first dua that was made for was regarding salah. And the importance of salah we hear all the time. Um, Mufti Zahar was just discussing uh, Surah Al-Mu'minun as well. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that successful are the believers in the first quality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions of the believers over here is الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ That those that number one obviously they offer their salah and they have khushu they have um, they have khushu and they have devotion when they are offering their Salah. So this is an important factor to teach us the concept of the importance of our salah. Um, as we know that even on the day of Qiyamah, according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the first things that a person will be asked regarding the ibadat is with regards to a person's salah. And the second portion of the dua is Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. That oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you hear, you listen, you accept our supplication. So despite being the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being Khalilullah that Ibrahim alayhi salam, still what is the dua that he is making? Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you accept our dua, you accept our supplication. And Surah Baqarah as well, we discussed this before. Over there, it was Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. And again, that was from amongst the du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So two things we learned from this du'a. Number one is the concept of the importance of salah. Just as how Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had a worry, concern for his progeny. In the same way for us as parents, for us as elders, we also should build this uh, this fikr, this concern, number one, within ourselves, number two, within our children, and make dua for our progenies to come as well. And number two, we should make this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that oh Allah, all of the ibadat that we do, the salah we pray, for example, the month of Ramadan, now the fasting that we are doing, the duas that we make, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you accept all of our duas. Amin ya rabbil alameen. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. This is the dua that I'm sure many of you know, and some of us or many of us who recite this at the end of salah uh, before we say the salam. And it's actually very appropriate we make this dua, even though we don't have to make this the only dua to be recited at the end of salah. There's other duas as well. And it's actually very appropriate because it says, Oh Allah, make me of those who establish the salah. And you're about to conclude your prayer. And Ibrahim made this dua at the time of. You know, in Mecca, rebuilding the Kaaba, saying that, oh Allah, make me of those who establish the Salah and of my progeny as well. And we see now how Allah accepted this dua of Ibrahim. So we have so many people in Ramadan over, who knows, you know, billion people, millions of people facing towards uh, the Kaaba. And then the way he worded it, Rabbi Ja'alni, oh Allah, make me of those who establish the Salah. As if those who are establishing the salah are better than Ibrahim. Even though there's no person who establishes the salah beside Allah, there's no person who is better than Ibrahim. But to show the status of the one who prays salah, Ibrahim saying, Oh Allah, make me of those group of people. Okay, so let us repeat this dua, inshallah. Repeat it after me. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salati wa min dhurriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. All right, we'll conclude here. I'll see everyone tomorrow.